the counter current exchanger it utilizes a Kepler network called the vasorecta and this vasorecta is highly permeable to water and solutes so the flow of blood in the vasorecta is also flowing in a counter current direction and what happens is nicely seen on this next diagram we can see that the vasorecta is highly permeable to both water and solutes and so the blood going from the efferent arteriole it starts off with a osmolality of 300 milliosmoles and towards the bottom that quadruples to 1200 milliosmoles at the hairpin turn but then we start to see the opposite occurring where by the time it gets to the vein it's back to about 300 325 milliosmoles so the counter current exchange is for the vasorecta and the counter current multiplier is referring to the renal tubule itself that is in the juxta medullary nephron loop. So the mechanism now, the reason this is so important is to form both dilute and concentrated urine, which we see very, very nicely shown on this next slide. So in this case, in the image to the left, we can see that in order, if we're overhydrated, we have no, we have no ADH. So what's going to happen is that the osmolality of the extracellular fluid is um, going to lead to a, if there's a low osmolality, it's going to le lead to a low decrease of ADH from the posterior pituitary. There's a lack of aquaporins or water channels in the collecting duct as a result of that because the ADH, it signals the formation of these aquaporins. Since there's less aquaporins, there's less water reabsorption from the collecting duct. And as a result, there's a large volume of dilute urine. So the reabsorption means returning or reclaiming into the blood vessels. So we see this shown here on this diagram. So the descending limb, as we know, is where water is reabsorbed. So the concentration goes from 300 to 1200. And then in the ascending limb, there's reabsorption of salt. But in response to the concentration of the plasma, there's going to be dilute urine that's formed. And so we see that the concentration goes down to 100 at the base of the collecting duct. Whereas if we go to the right, to the opposite extreme, if we're dehydrated, we need a maximal amount of ADH because we're losing lots of water, lots of sweat. So we need lots of water to be reabsorbed into our blood vessels so that the high osmolarity, osmolality of extracellular fluids leads to an increased release of posterior pituitary from the posterior pituitary gland, leading to an increase in water channels, the aquaporins in the collecting duct, to reabsorb more water, thus leading to a small volume of concentrated urine. And that, of course, is to maintain a um, to maintain the blood volume since we're losing all of this water. So you can see the extreme difference here. We have a concentration of 1200 milliosmoles in the urine 12 times more than the dilute urine which we saw in the first diagram. So our next slide it goes over um, urea recycling and the medullary osmotic gradient. And the purpose of this urea recycling is that it occurs not only by facilitated diffusion, but the cortical collecting duct, it reabsorbs water, leaving that urea behind. 
and the urea then moves back into the ascending thin limb, contributing to the high osmolality in the medulla. So it's normal for some, um, some urea to be in the blood. It's uh, measured with the bun in the hospital called the blood urea nitrogen. It's a measurement of kind of how healthy the kidney is. So for clinical evaluation of the kidney, that's usually done with a simple uh, urinalysis with a urine sample that the patient gives. So certainly a test for legal substances, but it also can affect, it can test for abnormal renal function that's assessed by measuring nitrogenous waste. These wastes should be in the blood only, but if there's damage to the glomerular membrane, then those nitrogenous wastes could make their way through the renal tubule and then eventually end up in the urine. So to determine the renal clearance, which is essentially how efficiently the, um, everything is being removed by the kidney, both blood and urine are required. So the definition for renal clearance is the volume of plasma that the kidneys can clear of a particular substance in a given time. And this is usually detectable on a chart. It's important to monitor this to help to detect glomerular damage to prevent the progress of renal disease and also to determine the normal glomerular filtration rate, which should be about 125 milliliters per minute. So urine is very, very important. Um, it should contain nitrogenous waste, some normal amounts, but not, not excessive. So it should be at below a certain level, but those nitrogenous wastes include urea, uric acid, and creatinine, which is not the same thing as creatine. Creatine is used in muscle metabolism. So abnormal examples of what are possibly found in the urine could be any of these things that are listed on this table. Things like glucose, glucose should not be in the urine, proteins, ketone bodies, hemoglobin, bile pigments, red blood cells, and white blood cells. White blood cells are commonly indicative of a UTI, a urinary tract infection. Diabetes mellitus is indicative of sweet urine, sugary urine. And again, that's because the amount of glucose that's in the blood exceeds the transport maximum, which we've talked about earlier. So urine should be slightly acidic, a pH of around six, can range uh, between 4.5 and eight, it, but it can vary by diet. So if somebody has a very acidic diet, lots of proteins, whole wheats, that pH can drop. Um, also an alkaline diet, vegetarian diet, that can lead to an increase in pH. And the specific gravity, the specific gravity is the ratio of the mass of the substance of equal volume of water to the mass of equal water. So specific gravity of water should be around one but urine is slightly higher than that because there's going to be other solutes in it that are going to be responsible for that.